All right, so uh, I'm Chris Larson. I'm an osteopathic family physician from Austin, Texas. A little bit of background about me is I, uh, I have a degree in finance from University of Texas at Austin. Right out of undergrad, I uh, moved over to Houston and started working in energy investment banking and then uh, moved over to trading natural gas options. Thank you. Right about the time that this small company called Enron blew up from a financial standpoint. And so I then decided to, uh, to move over and, and go to, to medical school. And even while I was in medical school, I had already decided that I wasn't going to be able to work in insurance-based practice. And so luckily, just a couple of years after graduating from residency, I started reading about direct primary care and opened my practice up from scratch. And about the same time, there was another doctor in the local area, Mike Garrett, and he invited me to this conference. And that was a few years ago. And at that conference, which was in Arlington, Virginia, I heard a few speakers talk and basically based on those discussions decided, decided to pivot my practice and as opposed to focusing on individuals, focus on recruiting employers. And so since that time I've gained access to a couple of larger employers. I've got a 350 patient employer in Houston and a 300 patient employer in Lubbock and so those are a three hour drive and a five hour drive away from my location and so I take care of them virtually, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, as we move forward. So um, I don't, for these events, they usually ask you to give your uh, slides about a month beforehand, and uh, I did that, and I have three kids under the age of four, so I don't have a lot of free time, and I think I may very well have a little bit of brain damage to go along with that, and um, so I really didn't time this out until yesterday, and I was way over. And so I'm going to skip through a lot of the slides at the beginning. I'll summarize them based on one slide. Um, but really the ones that I'm going to slip or skip are just kind of a preamble of why I think you might consider working with employers. So, so why work with employers? You know, everybody up here has basically talked about how they've worked with individuals. And as you've seen, they have all have smiles on their faces. They're all very happy with what they're doing. So why consider working with employers? You know, when I see uh, doctors switching from an insurance-based practice and switching over to direct primary care, they seem to be filling up their practices relatively rapidly, especially if they're able to go back and recruit from that insurance-based practice. So from one to three years, they could be full with their own private panel. And like I said, they're very happy with this. And while I agree that this is the purest form of direct primary care with that patient choosing their doctor and taking their own money to pay that doctor. And I think that that model is the best for doctors and it's the best for the healthcare system and it's the best for patients, those that can afford it anyway. For now, our country has decided to finance our healthcare system mainly through benefits that are funded in part by employers. And as you can see on this slide, nearly half of the American population is obtaining healthcare coverage through their employer. Of the remainder of people, the great majority of them are obtaining health care th coverage through a governmental source. So we've all tried to change the system from within the system, and it hasn't changed. Some of us have opted out, and we're working with individuals through direct primary care, and we're trying to le change legislation in order to change the system as well. And I believe that this is probably going to be more effective than working within the system, but it's still going to be a long slog to change the healthcare system as a whole in this manner. So the, the most easily accessible lever to change the entire system, in my opinion, is the same group that has the, the incentive or the biggest incentive to utilize highly effective primary care. And I'm talking about employers. And if we can get employers to consider changing the way that they pay for care in large enough numbers anyway, well, then the system can bend to their desires. This is the power of the purse string. If we all decide, hey, I, I all no longer want the, the, you know, the regular ophthalmoscope, I want it the panoptic, well, Welch Allen is no longer going to make the regular ophthalmoscope. They're going to make more panoptic. So we, the ones that provide the dollars, determine what the vendors do, and it's the same situation here. So we have an opportunity to help employers understand why they should change the way that they pay for care and to help them in implement that change. But we have to be willing to work with employers in order to change the system, and we cannot be so rigid as to say that it's our way or the highway. I think the stakes are just too high 
when you consider what have been the downstream ramifications of an out-of-control healthcare system. Okay, so I think this slide is, is relatively representative of all of the ones that I'm going to skip. So basically what you see here is a, uh, a slide from the Wall Street Journal based on Brookings Institution data where you see the siphoning effect of our healthcare system. And so what happens, and in, in this slide, this is based on middle class families, what you see is those families have had to reduce their spending on food, on services, on their housing, in order to pay for the increased costs of the healthcare system. So these middle class families are not the only ones that this is happening to. This is happening to us, because we all have to pay more for healthcare insurance every year. It's happening at companies, and we all have relatively fixed budgets. Well, certainly those budgets don't change as rapidly as healthcare costs do. So even for corporations, as they spend more money on healthcare, they have to take away money from what could you know, drop down to the employees in the form of wages. Governmental entities are not immune to this either. So cities, states, independent school districts, these independent school districts have to spend more money on the healthcare system. So basically what they do is they allot fewer funds for teacher pay and the number of teachers that they can employ. And you've seen a lot of uh, teacher strikes over the last year because of basically this particular issue. So for me, there's a, there's a larger goal here with direct primary care that I'm interested in. And number one is to try to change the entire healthcare system. And number two is to try to create enough demand for direct primary care that we can help extract our colleagues from the insurance-based system to come to this system where you see everybody smiling. Okay, so if we're gonna work with employers, let's talk about how the landscape looks. So this is um, data from Deutsche Bank. This is data for both 2000 and 2012. And um, what this shows is the uh, of the six million American companies in the US, it ranks companies by their size, by basically the number of employees. And as you can see, of those six million American companies, the great majority are small, having fewer than 20 employees. And this is basically what's been accessible to direct primary care over the recent past. These are the companies that are on the same street as your, as your clinic. If you, however, if you look at this data from a different standpoint and you compare the size of the company versus the percentage of the American population or the American workforce that they employ, 50% of the employers have 500 or more employees. And if you kind of add up all of the percentages from those companies that have 100 or more employees, Basically using that as a gross approximation for those companies that are, could be willing and able to change their healthcare benefit structure in order to optimize it for cost, those, those columns being the red one, the green one, and the purple one, well then you're basically looking at 70% of the American workforce that would work for a company of that size. So we're going to get into the weeds just a little bit here. I'm going to try to keep this at a high level. Um, and as you all join direct primary care and as you get further into working with employers, you'll hear these words a little bit more. You know, the concepts on this slide are important if you want to be a part of the sales process to employers, if you want to have an understanding of why direct primary care can be so powerful for self-funded companies. You know, the main difference between a self-funded, so these are really just two different ways to finance an employee benefit program. So the main difference between self-funding and fully uh, insuring is that with a self-funded benefit plan, the employer has the potential to recapture some of the money that they've set aside for their employee health claims. And so I'm just going to do a little bit of a comparison and contrast. Uh, the left column is the self-funded employer. The right column is the fully insured. And I'll just uh, start at the bottom. So on both of these, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. On the self-funded column on the left, all of those little boxes, if you wanted to as the employer, you could remove those and take that particular service out to the market and have it bid on by multiple different vendors. So you can optimize every one of those little boxes for cost. And then on the right side with the fully insured program, that's sold as a unit. It's basically take it or leave it. 
And so to go back down to the bottom and compare and contrast these two, both insurance products are going to pay taxes, they're going to pay commissions to brokers, and you're going to pay administrative charges for someone to administer the plan. On the right, you see the box for overhead and profit. These fully insured products on the right are sold by the companies that you've heard of, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, and they're going to bake their minimum level of profit into the monthly premiums. If you'll skip up a couple of boxes to the projected claims, this is where you start to see some differences between these two healthcare financing schemes. And on the right side in fully insured, the blue color in the box means that this is a fixed cost. It doesn't matter how few claims those employees have, how healthy they are, that cost is going to be the same month to month. If you switch back over to the left side with a self-funded company, the white color represents the fact that this is a variable cost. For that company, if they can keep their people healthy, if they can reduce the amount of claims for those people, well then that box decreases in size and eventually that company pays less for their health care. The top box is basically a financial buffer in case the claims go over the expected amount. And once again, on the right side with a fully insured program, it's blue. It doesn't matter if you never spend any of that money for that company, you're going to pay those costs every month. Where on the left side, if you don't spend any of that money, the company can recapture it. And so the, the basic difference between these two comes down to the, the fact that there's a different incentive based on if your company chooses to fully insure versus if it chooses to self-fund. If it chooses to self-fund, there's truly an incentive for you to help your employees stay healthy because if you do, you can reduce their amount of health claims. And if you're able to do that, you're able to keep some of the money for your company. And so the cost of a corporation's healthcare benefit program generally ranks second behind payroll on their list of the largest corporate expenses. So you would expect that these executives would apply all of the skills that they had learned in MBA school to try to optimize their plan for the purpose of reducing the amount that they spend on it. Because if they do that, they can use those savings for whatever they like. And so I'm certainly not suggesting that they do this, but as far as an incentive goes, they could add this to executive compensation. They could add this to research and development. They could drop this down to the employees and increase their wages, or they could drop it down to the profit line. So much to my surprise, when I talk to executives, they have what I call in health insurance fatigue when it comes to investigating and attempting to change their, their health plan for the benefit of their company and their employees. And they seem to have defaulted to thinking that just reducing the premium increase from year to year is the best that they will be able to do. And I think in some part, this crisis of confidence when it comes to these executives tackling a company or tackling an issue that's really weighing their company down may very well uh, be due to how their broker is compensated for their health, their health broker is compensated. I skipped a slide that showed that the average premiums for an American family last year was $19,000. So if you combine that data with the statistics that you see at the top of this slide, which represent the percentage that a broker would be paid to, to in, as a percentage of the total um, premiums for a, a medium-sized company, Basically, what that means is the broker can make $130,000 in revenue for a medium-sized company of about of 100 employees. And since the broker is paid as a percentage of premiums, what that means is that their revenue increases as the client's costs increase. And so you can imagine when I'm going into a company, I'm saying, hey, I'm direct primary care. I'm here to reduce your insurance costs. You can imagine what the broker is thinking about that. And so some companies are starting to pay on a uh, per, it's supposed to say per employee per month basis, and the average is about $20 per employee per month. And this is how a self-funded broker gets paid. Um, there's a twist here, though. So a broker that deals with fully insured companies gets paid by the insurance company, and their client doesn't know how much they're getting paid, and the client doesn't know about any bonuses that occur. 
A self-funded broker is paid by the client, and obviously the client would know how much they're paying. And so fully insured products are sold by um, all the companies that you've heard of, and they go by the acronym BUCA. BUCA stands for Blue Cross Blue Shield, United, Cigna, and Aetna. And the BUCAs want fully insured business, and they want to keep the fully insured business that they have because this is where they make their greatest profit. And so they're willing to pay brokers in a way to get as much fully insured business as they can. And a part of that is what's called a retention bonus. So a retention bonus is when an insurer would pay a broker or a brokerage group some percentage payment based on the total number of clients that already are with that insurer. They'll pay them to keep them with them. So let's just say as an example, Blue Cross Blue Shield is working with a broker that has 10 clients with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And Blue Cross Blue Shield could say, hey, if you'll keep nine out of those 10 clients with us, we'll give you a, a retention bonus. So if two of those clients get better renewal premium prices from, say, Cigna than they did Blue Cross Blue Shield, do you think that there's a possibility that that broker may do something to keep at least one of those groups with Blue Cross Blue Shield so that they can get their retention bonus? This is just one more way that the incumbents have to keep the system the way that it is. I've thrown supplemental insurance in there at the bottom so that you might understand why smaller brokers continue to work with smaller businesses. There are some insurance companies in states like Texas that no longer offer to pay a commission for groups smaller than 50. And so these brokers can go into groups of that size and they can still offer health care benefits and that's how they get access to the employees and the dependents, but they actually make their money by selling the supplemental products to those employees and dependents, life insurance, disability, and hospital indemnity. The premiums are lower on those products, but as you can see, the, the percentage commissions are a lot higher. So this is just an example of the incentives and the bonuses that brokers are faced with. This is a LinkedIn post from a, uh, a consultant in Amarillo, Texas, his name Josh Butler, I work with him. And the post indicates that there was a large national carrier that was offering an incentive payment to brokers that could get their clients to utilize a, a network that seems like it may be better for the insurance company than it would the client. Now, Josh believes that brokers should have transparency in their fees, but at this point, he's in the minority. This is a picture of a comment to that same LinkedIn post that kind of shows you the incentives that these brokers have to push clients towards a fully insured program. So in a fully insured program, that broker would have paid $40 per each member per month. Compare that to what you get paid as a direct primary care doctor as a uh, per member per month price. And on the self-insured price they side, they would get paid half that amount to get their client to, to move to a self-insured program. And so the, the cash flows and the flow of information gets relatively complicated when you're talking about insurance programs, brokers, and broker clients. So I made this picture to represent where everyone stands and what everyone gets. And so the broker is thought to be the consultant to the executives of the employer, but they're actually being paid by the insurance company. So the, the broker would provide advice to the executives of a company who would make a, an insurance purchasing decision, hopefully for the benefit of their employees and, and dependents, based on that advice, they would then pay premiums to the insurance company who would in turn pay commissions and retention bonuses to the broker. Now you might understand why the health insurance brokerage industry is ripe for disruption. You know, when I started in this, I would often... Um, demonize brokers in conversation. But as I've had more time dealing with this, I've kind of changed my viewpoint. These brokers are trying to make a living like you and I are, and they are, there's no malicious intent. But what is happening is that they're making rational decisions within a set of misaligned incentives. And there are other systems where people are making rational uh, decisions based on those misaligned incentives. And so these are, there are other systems where the incentives are just as perverse. And to paint with a broad brush, 
Insurance-based doctors are, from a financial standpoint, incentivized to see as many patients per day as they can. And that may very well sometimes end up causing um, decisions to be made that may very well not be in the best interest of the patient. There's no malicious intent here. They're simply doing uh, what they think they should based on the incentives, and I can understand that. So I think I've skewered brokers enough. Why don't we talk about how we might work with them? So first of all, don't pay for referrals. Phil Eskew covers this very well on his site, DPC Frontier. As physicians, we're held to a different standard. In any other industry, this is called sales, and you can pay with a commission. But not here. Really, the only way that you might be able to do this is to hire a salesperson, pay them a salary, and you have to have a long-term contract with them. If you want to do it in any other way, you're probably going to have to pay a lawyer a hefty sum to come up with a creative solution that may very well still leave you with risk. So in general, I would just suggest steering clear from paying anyone on a referral-dependent basis. Not all brokers are going to know about or be interested in direct primary care at this point, so if you can find a broker that is, help them. Offer referrals for whoever they might want to work with, Indi uh, individuals, small group, large group. You may find that geography leads to an increased value of your direct primary care. There are a lot of places around the country where there may be only be one or two small business insurance products, and many times those products have narrow networks or HMOs, so even though somebody has that insurance plan, they may not be able to access primary care. And in that situation, the value of your direct primary care and the access that you can give is increased. There's a broker in East Texas that basically uses this as his go-to product. He'll switch an employer over to the highest deductible HMO product they can find. Usually that's Blue Cross Blue Shield in, in Texas. And he'll take the savings from that to help them pay for direct primary care so that they can access primary care. Beyond just reducing the broker's revenue, you may be seen as a risk by the broker in the sense that um, you're really unknown to them and their clients until you have some history with them. And so the strongest thing that ties that broker to the company is usually their relationship with, to the decision maker. And so anything that might put that relationship at risk, meaning suggesting a vendor that ends up falling on his or her face, could potentially cause a souring of that relationship. So I'm telling you this just in case if you're working with brokers and they're not pushing your direct primary care as much as you would want, just understand that they may have this concern and be patient with them. Offer to go to meetings with them if you have time. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the first meeting, but if, if you can go to a follow-up meeting or if you can go to a meeting with them for a client that they already have, you're going to be welcome. Uh, at the end of the day, these are salesmen and they're saleswomen, and sometimes they're met with skepticism. So if you go win, with them, you lend your credibility. And so what's going to happen for you is as you're there, you're going to be able to have an opportunity to talk about direct primary care in front of the executive decision maker. And if they bring claims data from the employer, you actually can be utilized because you can go through that claims data and give a more granular view for that employer of what's going on with their employee population. And then offer to speak at their client events if you're interested. These brokers will take any opportunity they can to get in front of the executive decision maker. And they need new and exciting ideas to get the access to those guys. So you may, you know, and, and most executives at, at companies haven't heard of direct primary care at this point. So you may want to even consider cold calling some brokers in town and suggesting this idea to them. So I know I haven't painted the prettiest picture of brokers, but let's not give up on them yet. You know, just as there are a small group of doctors that are exiting the incumbent system and making decisions that would make their life a little bit more difficult in the short term, only to increase their job satisfaction in the long term, there is a similarly small and nascent movement amongst brokers that mirrors the direct primary care movement, and they call themselves Health Rosetta Brokers. So these guys believe in transparency of their own fees. They believe in extending the requirement of transparency to the pharmacy benefit managers. They believe in open health networks. They also want to shine a light on those healthcare services that have already been proven, and they want to scale those. So we're talking about things like centers of excellence for surgical care, 
for high-cost surgical care, and for direct primary care. You can find these brokers at healthrosetta.org, and there are about 60 of them across the country at this point. So let's talk a little bit about employer incentives. So um, with the Affordable Care Act, any company that had more than 50 uh, full-time employees or full-time equivalents was required to offer at least minimum essential coverage for an affordable price. And there's a calculation that they can use to figure out if something is affordable or not. Well, some companies haven't done this, and they're now starting to get their penalty letters from the IRS, and I've seen these letters. And these penalties are sizable. So these people are now going to be looking for some way that they can offer a plan to both meet the ACA criteria and provide care. Um, there's also been a, a change in the way that some companies have their premiums calculated, and this is the second bullet point. In the past, companies that were 1 to 100 employees um, had their premiums calculated based on, it's called experience. So basically what that means is, it's just like when you get uh, automobile insurance. It's, your premiums are in, in some sense based on how many wrecks you've been in, how many tickets you've had. Well, it was the same thing in experience in healthcare. It was based on how many health claims the employees have had. Well, that size company has been switched over to what's called community rating, which is basically just an average that everyone is going to pay. And so it's based on the industry that the company is, is in, what geography, what zip code they're in, and the age of the employee. So the, the biggest change was for groups that were 50 to 100, because they used to be experience rated, and if they had a healthy population, their premiums represented that. Well, now they've been switched over to community rating, and so they're likely to be subsidizing sicker groups within that industry. So if you can find that company that's 50 to 100 and is relatively healthy, they're probably highly incentivized at this point to switch over to a self-funded insurance plan so they can once again get their premiums in line with the health of their population. So certainly you would expect that companies want to save money, but this hasn't been as big of an incentive as I would have expected. I mean, I'm mainly finding that employers are willing to move in this direction when they're in financial dire straits and kind of um, ready to take on a vendor that may be relatively unproven like direct primary care. Some employers know that they're competing for employee talent and they want to be seen as offering a richer benefit. So in that uh, system, I would suggest kind of playing up that we offer concierge level services, we offer access, we offer access that would kind of mimic an on-site clinic in the sense that the employee can still stay at work and yet can access their doctor. Um, you know, it's not only kids that need name brands. I've had many executives indicate that they don't feel like they can switch their insurance plan if the new card would have a name on it that the employees didn't know about. And so this makes it a little bit difficult to get them moved over to a self-insured plan where the employees may not know the name of the insurer because they feel like they're getting something less than, than what's best. Um, you guys, we offer access as direct primary care. Many companies are now seeing the ramifications of offering these narrow network and HMO products and that their employees cannot get into their primary care physician. And so they're becoming more open to paying for primary care outside of their insurance program. Like parents, some of these ex 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 executives just want to minimize disruptions. Um, I've heard multiple times that hey, you know, I'm just tired of people griping because we change insurance programs year to year. I'm tired of hearing griping when people say, hey, my doc isn't in this new network that you guys switched us to. And so sometimes there's an inertia for the company's insurance program that's just there because the executives don't want to hear any griping from the employee population. And then at times the executives make decisions with only themselves in mind. What happens here? is that the employees don't take the coverage that's available to them. And what the executives might say is, our employees don't want this. You can translate that into the employees can't afford what's being offered to them and they don't accept it. But what ends up happening is basically it's just the executive population that has that coverage. And since that's the case, they will often make decisions on what they're going to do based on what they think is best for them and their families, since they're the only ones that have that plan. So how much you engage small employers? And I think some of these things have been covered in other talks. So I called a number of direct primary care doctors prior to this event to basically just take a poll of how are you accessing employers? And overwhelmingly, they're getting access to them through their social networks. So 
certainly family and friends, but they're also looking at their, their private, their patient panel and saying any of these people that are my, already my patient that have a small business, if they like me, I'm going to talk to them about signing up their small business. Chamber of Commerce, what I would suggest is that this is great in a smaller community, not so great in a larger community. I'm in Austin. We've got a million residents. I mean, my Chamber of Commerce is dominated by National Instruments Dell. It costs about $800 to $1,000 to join. I haven't even tried it. But there's a, there's a direct primary care doctor in a suburb that has about 30,000 uh, residents, and they've joined their Chamber of Commerce, and they've actually gained access to a couple of employers because of that. Um, Get, a, get involved with business and trade associations. In Austin, we have a couple, and this is a really great opportunity to sit beside the executive decision makers at these meetings for 16, you know, 15 to 60 minutes. It's really difficult to be invited into their office to talk to them about their health care plan. But if you can catch them at one of these association meetings, it's just an easy way to access them. And then you may very well be asked to speak at one of these events, and so you have a captive audience uh, for 15 to 60 minutes to tell your story about direct primary care. And then look for and offer to speak at conferences. There was, a, there was a direct primary care doctor in the Pacific Northwest who put out a Facebook post about speaking at a state of reform conference there. And he said, hey, the same conference is going to be in Texas in a couple of months. I looked at the site. I happened to know one of the board members and I asked him if I could be a part of the conference. He got me on one of the panel discussions. And after the panel discussion, I had an employer a local employer that had 100 employees engaged me in a conversation, and we're still in talks about being able to engage them for direct primary care. As far as business vendors go, to me that kind of means professional CPAs, lawyers that might work with businesses. If they feel like you might be able to help their, help their relationship, they can put you in front of those employer clients. And then Vistage is a national organization that puts small company CEOs into CEO learning cohorts, and they've got a CEO coach that sits with them. That CEO coach then has a group of vendors that they have access to. Um, you know, somebody being in healthcare could be one of those vendors. And when one of the CEOs needs help, they'll tap one of those vendors to come in and give consultation. And those vendors are also asked often to come in and give presentations to that group of CEOs. In my area, it costs about 300 a month to be a part of that group, and I know that there's a direct primary care in Louisiana that's been in this and has gained access to a couple of employer clients because of it. As far as large employers go, you can skip HR. Um, that's typically a dead end unless an executive above HR has suggested the meeting. At the end of the day, there's, just, there's no upside for HR and there is downside. If they bring in direct primary care and you hit it out of the park, and there's 30% savings on that plan, what do they get? Do they get a raise? Do they get moved up to the executive suite? Do they get a change in their title? They don't. That's just not the path of HR. But if, if the plan falls on its face, all fingers are going to be pointing at them. As far as working with brokers, my belief is this is the most sustainable and easiest path to talking with the executive decision makers. We've already talked about working with the health benefit um, brokers. You can also work with property and casualty brokers who might have a relationship that's strong enough with the executives that they can bring you in to talk about the health plan. You're going to need to speak in terms that they understand. We form strong bonds with our patients but we will not often sell direct primary care to employers because of that bond. So you're going to need to translate what you do into terms that they can understand. And using something like CFO Magazine, basically just as a way to pick up on the lingo so that you can fit in while you're there is a great way to do this. Pretty much when I'm in a room with an executive that has more than 100 employees, it is almost guaranteed that they're going to ask for multiple doctors and they're going to want to know what you're going to do for their employees that are remote from their site. And so as a group, we're going to need to find a way to network together so that we can serve these larger employers who have employees spread across larger cities, if not spread across the state, if not spread across the country. It's a lot easier to sell direct primary care when it comes integrated within a plan as opposed to just trying to sell it as a bolt-on. I'm sure we all refer back to Q-Lions and Union County data as far as the savings that we can guarantee 
are going to come, but this is still just a difficult sale. When you say, hey, we're going to increase your fixed cost employer, you'll just have to wait on that savings, but trust me. If you want to start doing the prospecting on your own, you can use a, a website called MyEdge to basically go out and query a database to find the self-funded employers, and then you can parse that data based on geography and size, and then you can start going out and trying to contact them directly. You can write letters, you can use LinkedIn to find them. So if you land the employer, you're going to need to contract with them. And what I would suggest is that you make this easy on yourself. And so you're going to want to accept one payment, and that should be from the employer. You probably also should define kind of the minimum acceptable number for an employer, the minimum acceptable number of employees where you would offer a discount, because some of these employers are relatively small, smaller probably than some of the large companies that you're taking care of. And if you wouldn't offer a discount to a large family, well, then you probably shouldn't offer that discount to an employer that may have three or four employees. You're going to want to put term and termination in your contract. Basically what I do is I try to match the term based on the size of the employer. So for smaller employers, I'm trying to reduce barriers to get them to sign up. And so what I'll do is I'll make it like a private patient contract and basically just allow them to go month to month. For a larger employer, I'm going to keep the term the same as their insurance. And then don't skip any steps with patients that you get from employers. I'd suggest signing a contract with them so that they know what they can and can't get from your practice. Make sure that you give them access to the notice of privacy practices. And then decide how you're going to handle patients that call you with urgent issues prior to um, starting care with you. Now, when, when an employer starts with me, I reach out as soon as they're uh, able to be on the plan to engage them and say, here I am, this is what I am. Um, I'd like to have a, start a conversation with you to basically learn more about you and start taking care of you. You're going to have employers that don't write, write back after you do that. And so, um, and they may very well call you on a Thursday night and say, hey, I know I've got access to you. I've got a sore throat. Can you help me? And in that situation, I would generally just handle it like you might handle it on, you know, call for a, a patient of a doctor that you're on call for is take a full history Give them the best advice that you can. If you can't help them there, send them on to the appropriate venue. But at the end of that conversation, what I would say to my patient is, hey, we really need to get form a stronger bond here, so I'm going to call you tomorrow or the next business day, and we're going to make an appointment to start that. It's just not worth souring a business relationship by saying, hey, you haven't really done your part to engage with me, so I'm not going to take care of you right now. I'm going to skip this one. So let's talk a little bit about employer plans. Um, these are the plans that I uh, am most knowledgeable of. Certainly there are other plans out there. There are other TPAs out there. So Sidera is a uh, medical cost sharing organization that works with corporations. Their philosophy is similar to the Christian healthcare sharing ministries like Liberty or uh, Samaritan Ministries. And... Um, they, I think they started in 2015, and they indicate that they have members in 33 states. As opposed to deductibles, they have initial unshareable amounts, and that initial unshareable amount can be chosen by the patient. And so, you, as you can see here, the, the premiums are you know, relatively affordable when you compare that to major medical, and the premiums vary based on the age of the employee and the initial unshareable amount that is chosen. So they do give a discount for direct primary care. That discount is anywhere from $9 to $26 per employee, and that's based on the employee's age and the initial unshareable amount chosen. This is not insurance. There is no guarantee of payment with this group, and there can be restrictions on, on what they offer. So any health care costs that are a result of using illegal drugs or participating in illegal activities can't be shared with the group. There are limitations on coverage for those people that use tobacco. Um, Sidera doesn't cover things like routine physical, vaccines, screening labs. So one more place that we can kind of get into the weeds, I'm just gonna kind of really try to hit the high points on this. And there are, there are different ways that insurance plans can pay for medical services. And PPO has kind of been in healthcare history, the most recent way that plans have paid for healthcare claims. What is a, uh, a newer movement is something called reference-based pricing. 
and the reference point is the Medicare rate. So what this graph shows is kind of a lot of the components associated with what an insurance company might be concerned about. So I'll stop with, start with a top line, which is an orange line, and that's the amount that, say, a hospital would bill for its services. And so these are all ranked as percentages based off of cost. The line below the orange one is a gray uh, line, and that's the PPO allowable amount. That's what the PPO would pay, um, independent of how much is charged by the, uh, the hospital. The dark blue line below that is 150% of what Medicare will reimburse. Below that is a turquoise line, which is considered to be the cost of the hospital. And below that is what Medicare reimburses. So they reimburse below cost. And so um, when an employer would use a reference-based pricing plan, basically what would happen is they pay a set amount, kind of like any other insurance plan, right? So your homeowner's insurance doesn't say, hey, we'll guarantee that you can have a new house built by any builder that you want. They say, we're going to pay you the average amount in your area to rebuild your home. Here you go you go find a builder that can do an appropriate job for you. That's how these plans pay. They say we pay 150% to hospitals based on the CPT codes that you're, you're, they're using. So there's a potential for what's called a balanced bill here. That basically, if the hospital says, hey, the facility portion of your knee replacement was $10,000, and the employee's plan says, okay, based on the CPT codes, all we pay is $6,000, the hospital is going to go looking for someone that will pay the remainder of that $4,000. So that's a balance bill. And so in these situations, there's no networks. A patient can go to any hospital. They can go to any doctor that they want to. But once again, their plan only pays a set amount. And so in this situation, these patients need help. They need someone to hold their hand and to guide them through the opaque healthcare system. And that's a great place for direct primary care to fit in. So Allied National is a third-party administrator, also known as a TPA. And TPAs, at a minimum, will administer and process the claims of employees of self-funded companies. TPAs can also act as a hub to a collection of services where when they're all used, it would mimic a fully functioning healthcare plan. Allied has been around since 1970 and may have been one of the first um, insurers to work alongside direct primary care. They utilize reference-based pricing, there's no direct contracting, and they offer a discount if the employer utilizes direct primary care. Um, they have about 180 patients using these plans, and that's spread over about 30 employers. Dan Milan is their ranking uh, sales representative, and I know he's here at this conference. Intrust is another third-party administrator and they're, and they're in Houston and they have plans that are built to integrate with direct primary care. They also utilize reference-based pricing but they have safe harbor hospitals associated with their plan as well. They have 5,000 patients which includes dependents utilizing these employer-based plans that have direct primary care that come with it and that's spread over about 39 employers. And so as you can see, the average for them is a little bit larger at maybe 110 employees per company. And the largest employee has about 600 employees. So David Jacobson is their vice president of sales. He'd be happy to hear from you as well. He basically created these plan designs, which when he set them up, the goal was to try to kind of make this budget neutral for companies when they switch over from what they had been using to this. So he'll try to find ways that with the plan to reduce the cost for the employer so there's a little financial buffer to put direct primary care in there with it. So these plans are built to integrate with and leverage direct primary care. Direct primary care is a, is a part of the premium. I'm, I skipped a slide about IRS regulation, but it's probably safest to make sure that the direct primary care premium is included with uh, the health care plan premium. And just like we can uh, find services that you can get at a lower cost when you pay cash, like imaging and labs, well, most insurance plans don't have a mechanism to pay for that. Insurance plans pay 30 days later, 60 days later, when an EOB, is, a bill is sent in. So it doesn't really help us in the moment 
when a vendor says, hey, I'll give you a cash discount, but you have to pay me right now. These plans are built in a way so that they can use that mechanism to help the employer and the employee in this situation. Basically, what would happen is labs and imaging and at-home sleep studies cost so little that it doesn't take much for the health plan to say, yeah, we'll pay for those things. And so often these plans are set up so that there's a very low copay or it's just free to the patient to get these things. Um, the, the practicing direct primary care doctors here, I know share my frustration when I'm in front of a patient and I say, hey, you need an MRI. And their response is, doctor, I know that you've done the investigation to find me the lowest cost MRI, but I haven't hit my deductible. And even at the low cost that it's at, I still can't afford to do this. And these types of plans help with that situation. And then they have safe harbor hospitals. So what happens here is in order to try to reduce the likelihood of that balanced bill, the plan will go in and they'll go to a hospital and they'll negotiate and they'll say, if you'll take this price for your service, what we'll do is the plan will pay the patient's copay and deductible. And that's going to be our trade-off because from the hospital's standpoint, the greatest part of their accounts receivable these days are the deductibles that they can't get from the patients that are showing up at their hospitals. So this makes it a little bit easier for these hospitals to make this trade. And from the standpoint of the employees, what ends up happening is this gives them access to emergency care and hospital care, often at no cost to them, potentially at a low cost to them. So okay, we've got a, we've got a great plan design and uh, it does multiple things for the, for the employer um, it allows them to stay safe with the IRS in the way that direct primary care is paid. It allows them to reduce the total cost of the plan. And when it's used correctly, it gives the employees access to hospital-based care and surgical care at low cost or no cost. We need a way to connect these people with direct primary care. And I think we could probably all agree that the best way for this to happen is for individual patients to say, I want that doctor. But that's just not where we stand today when we work with these employers. It's just not that easy. So for now, my suggestion is that, is that we need some intermediary that can be a go-between in between the employer and the direct primary care doctor. I'm not saying that it's always going to be this way, but I think for now we probably need this. So my MD Connect is a physician practice uh, opened by Jeremy Smith. He's an East Texas doctor, and the goal of this is to allow independent direct primary care doctors to stay independent and serve their own private patients while they're able to serve employer-based patients and their dependents. In order to meet this goal, a doctor will eventually have to go sit in front of the company and sit in front of the TPA to explain the nuances of direct primary care and to sell this, and they can support in that process. There are on-site visits that can occur for those doctors that practice virtual direct primary care, which basically occurs when we have an employer that's relatively far removed from that direct primary care doctor. And when we go on-site for an official a, a, a visit to begin the process of kind of getting to know the patients, gathering data like lab values and uh, vital signs and such, they support that process as well from a logistical manner so that the doctor can walk in, do what they need to do, and go home. They support basic data transfer, and I know that this is a hot button topic. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. This is nothing like what you might be expected to do in an insurance-based practice, but larger employers, whether we like it or not, are going to expect some level of data. And I, am, I basically think that we ought to give them utilization data, and that's about it. And certainly not utilization person by person, but as a group. And so if we're going to provide this data, we have to provide it like everybody else does in the healthcare system, which through an electronic form. And MyMD Connect can basically translate your data so that you can give it to any TPA. And we can't just work with one TPA because every broker has their favorite TPA and they're going to want to use that one. So we have to be able to work with all of them. And then every once in a while, there's going to be an issue with a doctor, an em employee who is their patient. And these companies don't want to call up a doctor that they've never talked to before and say, hey, what's going on? How can we rectify this? They want a single point of contact to rectify this issue. And MyMD Connect can, uh, can provide that. So let me tell you a little bit about full versus virtual direct primary care. 
Um, we've sold these plans to employers in locations where there are no direct primary care doctors. And some of these companies are small enough that they don't have enough money, money that we could basically go out and recruit a full direct primary care doctor to just take care of that employer population. And some of these companies really just don't have it within their budgets to pay for full direct primary care. So we've had to kind of create a new service level to meet the needs of some of these employers. And that new service level is virtual direct primary care. And really all that this is, is just a subset of the services that you already provide to your private patients. It's basically when your private patient goes on vacation is in, in another city, any service that you would normally provide to them in a, that situation is what we would do in virtual direct primary care. Basically everything other than what you could provide face to face. So I'll just go through a compare and contrast. So access will be similar to what you would provide to your own panel patients. And that's gonna be access for both acute and chronic care. And just like with acute care, if it's something that you don't feel comfortable taking care of with a phone call, if they need to go to an urgent care, well, it's the same thing with these virtual direct primary care employer-based patients. If you can't take care of it, it's okay. Send them to the right venue to have them taken care of. You can also give extended visits in the virtual plan just like you would your own patients. You can offer those cash-based discounts like I talked about with these plans that make the mechanism viable so that sometimes their plan can pay for it. So for radiology, for labs, they get cash-based discounts. You're gonna manage their medicines just like you would your own patients and you actually have access into the formulary with these patients so you can know what they get a discount on and what they don't get a discount on. You're gonna coordinate their care in the hospital and with specialists. So basically the only thing that you won't be able to provide to these people is those, that type of care that requires that they be face-to-face -face with you or any procedures that you might only be able to provide in a face-to-face -face manner. So I want to talk a little bit about um, adverse selection. This is what I call anti-cherry picking. So adverse selection is when buyers have more information than sellers. This has traditionally been talked about in insurance circles. But we are, all are exposed to adverse selection. We post our prices online and we take all comers. And so someone that's going to pay you the price that you post online, they feel like they're going to get a deal. They're not just paying you money for no reason. And so when you look at all of the population of America, we're getting a different population than just the general population. So if you compare that to basically taking on a group that's just granted access to you like an employer group, you're gonna get the full span of the population. So you're gonna get those people that truly are healthy and really only wanna come into a doctor's office every three to five years. And you're also gonna get the other end of the population where they're very sick. And so when you combine those two groups, what's gonna happen is the total utilization per person is going to change and it's going to decrease. And so this is just a, a couple of Venn diagrams to roughly show you what would happen if you took on only private patients versus if you took on only employee-based patients. And so the blue uh, circles represent how many of those patients are really gonna utilize your services versus the yellow circles show kind of the entire panel size. So in an employer-based model, and so certainly you can kind of merge these two as well, but if it's strictly employer-based, you should be able to tolerate a larger panel size without having to spend any more of your time working for those patients. And this kind of gets down to the heart of the matter for direct primary care doctors. This is a table that basically compares these different models of care. And so the left column is a traditional private practice, direct primary care. The right two are the employer-based full direct primary care and virtual direct primary care. I'll start in the first row, which is panel size. So I'm, I'm basically seeing direct primary care doctors that are mainly taking care of private patients say I'm tapped out at 600. As you move along to the right, that panel size increases based on the previous slides. And I understand when you see that 1800 number under virtual direct primary care, you're saying, hey, this is approaching what I'm trying to get away from. It, but just understand, drop down a level, drop down a row and look at that utilization rate. And what that means is you're gonna spend as much time taking care of that group of virtual patients, that 1800 panel, 
as you would a private panel that has only 600 patients because the utilization rates are different. And if you'll drop down below that, those are just averages that the doctor would get per person or per employee. And below that, you can kind of see the annual revenue per model. And when you compare these, you could be paid at the same level or higher by working with these employer populations, and it's not going to take any more of your time than a private population. So as far as data goes, um, these are the only six codes that I use, and these are basically just utilization data. Some of these employers are paying thirty to $50,000 per month for direct primary care. And to think that they're going to do that and expect nothing in return is, I think, naive. So I can kind of understand. I, I w didn't spend a whole lot of time in insurance-based practice. So I think there are a lot of you out there that have a lot more trauma associated with coding than I do. And so I can kind of understand the reticence to do this. But really what ha happens here is this takes me about two or three seconds per visit to do this. These are the only six codes that we use. And basically it's just, did I see the person? Did I text with the person? Was there an assessment and a diagnosis? So as far as working with MyMD Connect, all they expect is for you to treat their patients like you would treat your own. Um, you, you might be asked to attend and speak at enrollment meetings. This is where the enrollment benefit is rolled out to the employees. This is going to be a new benefit for most people, so they're going to want the doctor there to say, this is what direct primary care is, this is what you can get from it, this is what you can't get from it. Virtual direct primary care, you'll be asked to come on site one time at an initial visit to basically say, do meet and greet visits with people. So these are five to ten minute visits where you say, hey, I'm not a hologram behind a, you know, telemedicine, I'm here to take care of you. And um, you're going to be paid for that visit. You've got a group of people there to help you, taking vital signs, blood draws. You're going to do a minor physical exam and a short discussion. These groups are different than your private patient panel. They haven't voted with their pocketbook necessarily on direct primary care. You're going to have to teach them about direct primary care. But what I have found is that they're, um, they're very happy with the care and they, they like this benefit because I'm able to spend so much time with them that they really enjoy this, even if it's just virtual. And honestly, I enjoy introducing populations of people to direct primary care that probably may never have been introduced to it otherwise. So I'll just leave that there. I had a few more things to say, but I think there's only just a couple of minutes, so I guess we'll use that time to answer questions. Okay. Yeah, so how do you go about terminating a patient whose relationship is no longer therapeutic, who's come to your practice via an employer benefit? Um, this is the same as a private patient. I mean, nobody expects you to be abused just because an employer is paying for this. And I don't think that there's ever been um, any expectation on any, a part of any employer that I've ever worked with where they say, I don't care what these people do, you're going to take care of them. And so I've never, I feel like I'm pretty easy to get along with. I've only, I've never fired anybody from my patient panel. I, I have not allowed people to come back, but I've never fired anyone from my patient panel. And I, I generally try to find ways to work with people. And I do the same thing with these employer-based patients. But if there is a need to fire someone, I think potentially we may, depending on what the problem is, we may attempt to shift them to another doctor that's practicing in this manner. But if the patient needs to be fired, there's no problem with firing them. What, what is the safest percentage of employer-based direct, direct primary care patients to have in your practice? So I think this gets to the point of people's concern of, hey, too large of a percentage of my practice is with this employer. I've got too many eggs in one basket. And so what I would say is, you're in charge. You can do whatever you want. If I wanted to kind of basically utilize these employer-based patients to fund my growth of the, my patient panel size, if I'm full with private patients, I can always come back and say, you know, I don't really want to work with these employer-based patients anymore. And so in general, if you're having trouble growing, I would say this is a good way to grow and you're not beholden to them, and you're not necessarily tied to them long term. So you're always in charge, and you can come back and say, I don't want to work with them. 
And let's say that they are with you for a year, and after that year they say, hey, we're not paying you for, for these patients anymore. Well, you're really not in any different place than where you started from, other than you've had the income along the way to help you grow your practice. What do I see in workers' comp cases? Is there a conflict here? Um, patient injured at work has a disincentive to file their case of the care with me if it's free to the employer and paying for this disincentive. Um, what I do is, you know, obviously all the, patient, uh, all the patient information stays with me. They're my patients. I don't care where they were injured or how they got injured. If I can take care of them, I take care of them, and there's no different price for that. If it's a, a workers' comp issue where they need care outside of my office, that's when I think it's appropriate for them to use their workers' comp insurance, and that's how I handle it. I try to take care of as much as I can inside my office, and that includes both regular issues and workers' comp issues. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Larson. Thank you, guys. That was tremendous.